Hello. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to start off, so this is fame and fortune in OpenStack startup land. We're going to start off with introductions of, of each of the panelists, the names, and sort of the 30-second 30, 30 overview of your company. Okay, I'll start. Uh, my name is Francesco Paola. Thanks for uh, being here. Uh, I'm with a company called Selenia. We started Selenia a little over three years ago to help organizations adopt what we call open infrastructure, of which OpenStack is one component. Uh, and now we're slowly helping them to adopt and really deploy applications uh, to uh, the OpenStack infrastructure. I'm Samit. What, I'm what about, so have you raised money? Oh. Let's talk about the, the company itself and its, its history. Sure. Um, so we bootstrapped the company back in January 2013. Uh, my co-founder, Ken Peppels, who's the CTO of the company, and I, um, using services as a means to fund the company. And then we realized that we needed to grow faster. We also have a software component to our strategy. Uh, we felt that we needed to raise money in order to invest in that part of the business. And so last October, we raised a Series A uh, with uh, VCs and strategics uh, in, uh, yeah, in October of last year. And how much? Four million. Pesos, <laughs> dollars. <laughs> yeah. I'm Sumit. I'm founder and CEO at AppFormix. Uh, AppFormix is a product company. We started about two years ago. We've raised uh, seven million so far. And what we do is build a cloud optimization, optimization solution for uh, OpenStack and Kubernetes. I'm Christopher McGowan. I was the founder, co-founder, and chief te uh, technology officer of Piston. We were a startup that built a distributed uh, state machine uh, orchestrator that deployed OpenStack. Uh, we were acquired last June by Cisco, and we raised about $21 million. You guys raised 21? Yeah. Wow. Uh, I'm Randy Bias. I'm I was the CEO of Cloud Scaling, which was one of the founding companies in the OpenStack movement. Um, well, I'm 45 second limited, aren't I? No. Um, and uh, we raised 16, 17, something like that. And uh, we might have started the avalanche that resulted in <laughs> the first set of startups being acquired when we were acquired in October 2014 by EMC. And I'm now part of the Borg. So I'm Jesse Proudman. Uh, I was the CEO of Blue Box. So we founded Blue Box, and I founded Blue Box in 2003. Started as a managed hosting company, very similar to Rackspace. Uh, in 20, let's see, we raised in total 22 million. Um, we. I was the most capital efficient. You did a good job. All right. Uh, boot. Uh, we. Bootstrapped the managed hosting business for, for uh, sort of the first eight years and then launched our OpenStack product in 2012. Uh, we were acquired last June, uh, in fact, announced the same day as Piston uh, by IBM. So I'm now a CTO of Blue Box at IBM. And part of the board. And part of the, the big blue machine. Yeah. <laughs> blue ball. Yeah. Awesome. So what we, what we really wanted to talk about here, we've got a great group of people that are either actively involved in their companies or have, have been through the full cycle uh, of, of their companies. And so I wanted to talk about uh, sort of that experience and that process, and, and particularly as it relates to the OpenStack space today. And so sort of the, the first question I wanted to, to talk about with the group is, is OpenStack still exciting to the investment community? Oh, that, that ship sailed a long time ago, actually. Otherwise, I wouldn't have sold my business. I mean, we couldn't fund. I'm just being honest, right, because I'm here and it's already done. But we couldn't fund. We couldn't do the third round. And it was because if you talk to any VCs on the Hill, they're like, yeah, we don't think it's going to happen, right? We don't see the traction. You know, we don't see customer uh, uh, adoption, especially at products. It still seems like it's largely DIY. You know, you should have remained a services company, ha, 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 uh, and not changed to product. Um, and Francesco, who used to work for me, also tell me the same thing in the hallways that I should have stayed with services. But, uh, um, but you know, that was kind of their attitude. So I, I think it's pretty hard to get funding, although Francesco just did it. So I, I don't think it's impossible, but I think that it's more around the edges. Like if you're going to do like a distribution or try to do an appliance or any of that kind of stuff, I don't, I think it would be a very hard road to hoe. Yeah, just to, to follow on on Randy's comments. I mean, we raised, uh, as, as I mentioned last October, but we started off as an OpenStack services company helping enterprises and service providers adopt OpenStack. This was in 2013, and that was a way for us to get our foot in the door. It was a way for us to start raising or, or really 
getting revenue in the door to invest in the software platform that, that we're building today. Um, and as I mentioned before, we, we were, weren't growing fast enough. We needed the funding. And the key for us was to maintain the services piece to continue to fund the company and not have to raise an exorbitant amount of money and dilute the value of what we were doing. And so we found the right partners. Uh, and the reason why we found the right partners and why they funded us was, was to Randy's point, we weren't just about OpenStack. We were about adoption of open infrastructure. And what that means is OpenStack may be the kernel of what you're building your, your cloud on, but ultimately, the bulk of the work that we do today and our software platform really focuses on the adoption of applications to the cloud, the ability for organizations to adopt containers, to really uh, implement automation into the enterprise, to get that agility that is the promise of cloud. And so that story resonates a lot better than just, I am an OpenStack provider of tools or platforms or solutions or even services, uh, and you need to go beyond that, that core component, which is important, but it's not everything. And to touch on the good partners point, uh, Piston never actually had the opportunity to be a services business because one of the found or one of the venture funds that we raised money from only invested in enterprise software, and so as a, and they led their initial round. So as a business model, the the board was not willing to adopt. Oh, we're going to go and be a managed services provider while we build the technology. Yeah, I think. For, from my perspective, I'm more with Francisco here. Uh, you, have, you have to think about OpenStack being a piece of the larger puzzle, not, the, not really the, the whole puzzle in its entirety. We, as in AppFormix, when we, when we are out raising, it, the vision is about how do you enable cloud, right? How OpenStack fits in, how Kubernetes fit, fits in, how do you get enterprises to use VMs and containers with agility, like just as Francisco is saying. So I don't think, I mean, I don't think there was, from my perspective, looking back, I don't think so many OpenStack companies should have been funded to begin with. Uh, quite frankly, as time goes on, the distribution, like what comes out of OpenStack, the community is good enough. It's great, in fact. So perhaps too many VCs invested too much money too quickly, but I don't think so many companies should have been invested to begin with. So Randy, I'm curious, so it was also hard for us to raise our Series B, I actually ended up pitching 40 investors, got 40 no's, I fired myself, uh, hired a new CEO, and they were able to raise, so that, that worked out well for us. Um, but it, it, was, it was a big challenge uh, for our Series B. But in the last, I don't know, six or, or eight months, you've seen a number of new startups enter the space. You've got uh, what zero zero stack and platform nine and the the star guys, uh, and so it, it's this interesting challenge where sort of that those later rounds are difficult, but there still there still is money flowing in. Like, what do you think the logic is there? Well, there's always money flowing in. Um, you know, there's always VCs who will invest, but you know, if you talk to people who go and and talk to these VCs, there's there's sort of a hierarchy. Right, I mean, Sequoia, KP, they're kind of tier one, right? And then you got the tier twos and tier threes, and then you've got what people will refer to as dumb money, which tends to be sort of like edge, some much smaller funds. Um, and some people get very excited, and I love the Marantis guys, but you know, how, how much have they raised now? Like 200 million or something ridiculous? I mean, you know, I'm not going to call any specific VCs, but like some of the folks participating in the last hundred million, I mean, you got to wonder when that money's coming back. I mean, return on $200 million, it's going to take a long time. Um, so there's always money to get, but like, you know, when I took money from Trinity, I took it from, uh, not Trinity, I took it from a partner there who I trusted, who I thought would be in the long haul for me. And it was good because then I was able to raise my B round in difficult circumstances and they supported me. And I think like part of what you're doing is you're partnering with these guys, right? I mean, it's not just money, it's a marriage. It's like, you know, would I get married to this person? I mean, you have to ask yourself that question about your wife, your co-founders, your investors. And, you know, frankly, um, knowing what I know now, if I was in a position, I would hate to be in a position where I had to basically compromise that, that, that question, the integrity of that question, um, and take money from somebody who I didn't trust because I have seen, you know, the ship 
like not only go down, but in roaring massive flames with huge divisiveness between the investors and the founders. Um, and that's more painful than anything else. It's like having a divorce, not just with the divorce, but with the kids. And then you can tell I had that problem as a kid, but you know, it's a mess, right? Point is, is that um, there's, there's money and there's money. And you know, I would want you to take money from somebody who believes in you and believes in your company and your vision and your mission, you know, not just any money. And, and I think that while I can't speak to these particular investments, I, I definitely see that the tier one and tier two VCs are staying away from OpenStack for sure. And it's a little bit easier to raise an A round because you don't have any traction behind you. So you're funding not the reality, but the potential of what you're building. And if what you're building is amazing, or you can describe it in amazing circumstances and like very laudable terms, you will get someone behind you. Um, and it might not be a great round. It might be an okay round, like four and a half on 10 or four and a half on five. Um, it's when you try to go and get more money that it actually becomes a problem because you've operated for you know a year or two years on this money um, and what have you done with it and they don't care about oh we've implemented these 15 features it's how are you owning the space that you're building in what is your technology doing to make you and ultimately them money um, so your first year probably really easy to raise your second year or your second round much, much harder to raise because you have to have specific metrics around sales, around adoption, around uh, community. You have to show growth of people using your technology. Yeah, every that's a great point. Every single round has different optics, yeah. even if it's the same VCs because they've got these patterns in their head. You know, A, you've got technology and a promise. B, you've got initial customer traction. Yeah. C, you're starting to like really penetrate the marketplace. D, you know, is growth and, and so on and so on. And it's very templatized in their heads. It's either growth or uh, we're coming in and wiping the table and starting over. <laughs> yeah. And that one you don't want. And that's why we've been acquired by Cisco. Yeah, but to, to add to Randy's point, uh, it truly is a marriage. So choose your VC wisely is what I'd say. It's uh, It's not a... It's not Sequoia or, or Kleiner or a fund. It's a partner in the fund who's making the investment. Who'd you take money from? Uh, Vivek at August. And All right. He's awesome. And uh, and be prepared to ask the VC the tough questions and be prepared to get the tough questions as well. Like every single board meeting we are in, he's like, show me the metrics, show me the numbers. And it, sometimes it's tough and you know he'll be like, you're not working hard enough. And I'm like, hey, Vivek, I can't do any more than I'm doing. But he's like, no, you got to work harder. You got to get these things done, right? I mean, as you're saying, that 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 UI looks looks great, but where are the customers, right? right. So choose the VC wisely is, I mean, my biggest lesson. Yeah, true. I mean, to circle back to Jesse's original, original question, um, Clearly, if you have revenue coming in the door, whether it's services or product related, helps quite a bit because it validates part of your model. You're also selling on the promise of how that model is going to evolve. Um, and that's what we did, right? We had significant revenues coming in from the services side. Uh, there was a strategy that, that, that married a software platform to what we built for our customers. The VCs understood that message, understood the strategy, believed in us as a team, but also they saw the track record of two and a half years of actual revenue generation and successful deployments to say these guys actually know what they're doing. And likewise, from, from the flip side is you need to trust your, your VCs as, as these guys uh, have said as well. Um, so it, it, is, it is a mixed bag. I mean, in today's environment, pure infrastructure plays, uh, talking to some investors earlier uh, outside this room, uh, are difficult to fund. Uh, the, the environment is no longer there, it's no longer as frothy, so you have to go beyond the infrastructure play if you want to get funded uh, as, as an, in an A round and certainly a B round. You need to have the, a different story than I'm just going to focus on the infrastructure piece. It's, it's, it's much more diverse than that today. And one thing to note, yes, dollars coming in are dollars coming in, but dollars coming in have different values. Services dollars are only worth about twice as much as the dollar you have, whereas a product dollar is worth roughly 10. That's why you need the product vision 
Otherwise, I would never have funded the company as a pure services play. No way. Yeah, I think it depends on the on the on the VC as well, though, Francesco. I mean, Trinity was like was like your VC kind of you're used to doing pure enterprise software, and so it was it was very much you got to shut down your services business. And as Francesco tell you, we were doing multi million dollar contracts at the time that we like turned our back on and walked away from, <laughs> and took the revenue to zero in order to take the money from the VC. And I left. Yeah, which, is, which isn't to say that it was a good decision or a bad decision at the moment so much as it was a decision that the VC was comfortable with and they weren't comfortable with us retaining services. In retrospect, I think it would have been better to retain services because of the realities in the marketplace. But these guys are used to seeing lots and lots and lots of deals. You're, you're going to find maybe three, four, or five startups if you're lucky. These guys are going to find 50, 60, 70. Um, you know, they're going to do, you know, they're going to do five at a time, seven at a time in some cases, you know, and, and they're going to change several of those every year. So um, um, they see a very different velocity and think about it in very different terms. There perhaps is somewhat like maybe a bridge between this, this product and service discussion. So when we started, our goal was to build a product. I mean, it is to build a product. It's to build the best optimization product out there. But you can't build the product in isolation from customers. You have to get early customers. You have to turn those early customers into trusted partners, just like you're marrying the VC, perhaps you're marrying some of your early customers as well. We were lucky to get you know, a customer early on, Viasat, who really trusted us. And uh, they you know, shared their experience with us. We were able to give them very regular updates. Right? It's almost like in the as-a-service model. Our goal was always to get to that, that full product, but it took us many steps. You know, it's interesting. So at, at Blue Box, we had that managed hosting business, which uh, for all intents and purposes was a consulting, it was a consulting shop. Um, and it was generating quite a good chunk of revenue, but we had this debate at the board level all the time. Like, can, we, can we continue to focus on this portion of the business and build the, the product itself? Um, and we took the opposite approach. We ended up keeping it as a way to, to cash flow the rest of the, the operation and to fund a bunch of operating expense. Um, and I think, <clears throat> in retrospect, that was a really helpful. It was a really helpful piece because it it provided for two and a half years post post investment. It covered basically the the operating cost of the business. We were still burning money as we built the new the new product, but the operating costs on the day to day basis were were covered. We would have been bankrupt way faster, or been a very different company if we we hadn't had that. And so, we felt very fortunate to have. And it's funny because actually, when I when we pitched, when I raised the Series A, I went back and I looked at the pitch deck, which is the ugliest piece of trash I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, and it, it doesn't mention OpenStack at all. Uh, it doesn't say anything about private cloud. Like, there's nothing at all in there about it. Uh, so we we raised this money, and then after we raised it, we figured out what we were going to go build, uh, which which was a funny place to be in. Our first pitch deck actually said OpenStack in only insofar as our pitch was that we were going to build a transparent router that would sit on your firewall as an on-prem uh, appliance. And when you would make a request to a cloud, we would transparently redirect that to a different cloud. Of course, this is 2011, and there weren't any. Which was a little bit of a mistake on the part of us when we were like really excited about this and we were going to build it. And we realized when we had come back and actually went, we'd got the money, started, we built a prototype, and there was no market for it because no one had a private cloud or, or is even using public cloud. Guess what my pitch deck said? <laughs> uh, cloud stack. No. <laughs> no. It said, we're going to take OpenStack, and we're going to make it as compatible with Amazon Web Services as possible, and make it production grade, and turn it into a turnkey solution that enterprises can roll out to have an AWS compatible system. How'd that work for us? I've been very consistent, OK? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the pitch deck said it. My blog post, he said it. <laughs> Get up and present about it. Uh, yeah, and I, I did OK on the exit, so I can't complain. Yeah. So how compatible was it to AWS? Uh, roughly 87% for the EC2 APIs. That was actually the experience I had when actually doing the initial proof of concept of the, what we were calling the cloud router. 
And speaking of which, I'll plug it now. Uh, the EC2 API project in OpenStack is uh, my team member is the PTL for, and you know, if you set your OpenStack up correctly, you can get roughly 80 to 90 percent compatibility using it. And we're going to be expanding it. We added the VPC APIs to it, um, and we'll be doing a lot more as well. You can take the AWS command line tool that's in GitHub that Amazon provides, and you can point it right at OpenStack deployment with that bridge, and it just works. Awesome. That's awesome. Okay, so one of the things I've noticed uh, <laughs> now being part of part of IBM, sort of nobody gets fired for hiring IBM, right? So at Blue Box, we, we were talking with a bunch of banks, um, and I was all excited. We'd, we'd come back from summits and be like, oh, we're going to land this deal. Um, and as soon as the acquisition happened, we realized, I realized, like, we never were going to get any potential business with those guys. They just, just were going to take our time. Um, how do you think, we've got, we've got this challenge where the companies who, who spend the most money, put the most, mo like actually buy the most products in the OpenStack ecosystem are largely their enterprise companies. And those enterprise companies have hesitance to purchase from younger startups. Yet those startups are ones who are driving a lot of the, the innovation and pushing the edges. Like, How do you think we manage that duality in, in this ecosystem? And whether it's OpenStack or not, or you look at Docker, or you look at at any or Kubernetes or any of the pieces that are that are coming out, like how, how are we going to manage that challenge over the next four years? I'll go. Um, I I actually didn't have that problem. So what I saw is that because of the level of disruption right now, that there is an incredible willingness on the part of enterprises to engage with startups in a way that there hadn't been historically, and I and I think that's still true. So you know we got Walmart, we got AT&T, you know, we were having the conversations. I was about to land JP Morgan Chase before EMC took us out, like we were negotiating paper. So, um, so I don't, what, that was never my problem. My problem was that like in the OpenStack community, people didn't want to buy product. Like I couldn't get Symantec over the hump. Instead, they hired several hundred engineers. And then nine months later, when I talked to VJ, the architect, he was like, Randy, you were right. We had to redo everything that you told me we'd have to do in OpenStack. And I'm like, OK, so you rebuilt my product with 200 engineers over nine months because you wouldn't listen to me the first time. OK, it's cool. It's fine. I don't hold it against you. Um, and you know, same thing happened with Workday and Salesforce, and I go on and on and on. But like, our number one competitor was DIY, and towards the end, every once in a while, it was Red Hat and Mirantis. But you know, it was pretty easy to put the kibosh on that. Yeah. So I've been selling to the enterprise for twenty plus years. So um, it tells you my age. I was selling client server consulting services back in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, I was in the uh, e-commerce e-business space in the late 90s, early 2000s with a company called Side, where we uh, were pioneering e-business platforms to companies like the Chase Manhattan Bank and others. Um, and there's a certain way that you have to articulate your value proposition and how you treat enterprises in order to adopt this new and emerging technologies. The market is there, right? The market is there. The challenge that we found is that companies that don't understand how to sell the enterprise, that don't understand how enterprises actually incorporate new technologies into their environment piece by piece, being held by the hand, uh, and that's a challenge for a lot of startups that they don't understand, especially startups that are isolated in Silicon Valley. We're, we're there, but we, we have customers uh, all, all over the US. And so taking that experience in terms of what we learned in the 90s and the 2000s in selling complex technology and ever-changing technology, and today it's changing so much faster, you need advisory capabilities within your organizations, and you need people that understands how enterprises not only buy these new technologies, but also how they adopt them, and how the cultural impact of the new technologies uh, has an effect on how they make those decisions. And so the market's there. You just have to know what you're doing. And you have to not delude yourself into the difficulty of selling into the enterprise. Um, our first customer bought before we'd actually released our product, and they bought because they had the budget, um, but they also had to spend the budget, and they needed what we were providing. Um, and a lot of enterprises, a lot of like the banks, they start talking to you a year, two years before they're actually ready to buy because they have to evaluate the entire ecosystem. They have to evaluate the entire problem space. Um, and so we had this one sale that took us maybe three days to close from we had the first conversation, we had breakfast with them, we showed them the demo, we got lunch, slid the proof of concept paper across the table, like here, we want you to do a proof of concept, and they're like, no, we want to cut a check. And that's not how sales ever, ever actually goes. 
And maybe it but, was a bad thing then, right? But that, it, it was that, a, that it was really hard. One. Yeah, it was the first one. It was like, wow, this is gonna be really fucking easy. <laughs> Holy shit! Why have I not been in sales this far? It turns out I'm just really easy to delude myself into things that are easy once are always easy. Yeah, I mean, what what at least in our case, what we've seen is that selling into this open open stack ecosystem is be prepared for long sales cycles. People want to beat that thing down to the ground before they make a decision. We used to joke that our um, that our sales were either near instantaneous or took forever. I think uh, our average was nine months, but the reality is that they tended to be 12 to 18 months or three months or less. Um, and so, you know, that was really funny. I mean, we only did six deals, just being honest. They just were big. Our average deal size was very, very large. It was three to five racks, which is probably larger than mo the average. Um, but, um, you know, we, I, I don't know, I wouldn't go whale hunting again if I had the choice. We, Adam and I were joking, if we ever do another startup again, it's going to be SaaS, $9 a month, yeah. you know, so we can afford to lose customers easily because when one of those guys starts to threaten to walk away, you're like, no, here we go. We had about 49, um, but most of them were really, really small because they were small businesses that could get it up and running really quickly and would eventually grow. Um, all of the whales that we actually caught demanded to take investment in us, which is, if you're not in the middle of raising, kind of hard. So it also complicated the sales cycle and also our investment cycle as well. So in aside from all of this, the long sales cycles, uh, we just closed Rackspace. And we are going to be now. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So we're going to be on all Rackspace OpenStack clouds. So good things do happen. So we've got a few minutes left. I wanted to, to open the room up for questions, if anybody has any. Question first. Yeah, go for it. So after hearing us talk, how many of you actually want to raise it or do your own startup? <laughs> All right, I think we had four or five. Awesome. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, just come up to the mic. You should start your own startup. You really should. It's like raising a kid. Somebody else's kid? Yes, a kid you can't get rid of. I, don't, I tried to leave like twice, and the investors had the sit, the sit down moment of like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got a question. What did you guys do in your startups to, to maintain control? Um, we were company I was with, we were going for funding, and we had a, I, we asked for more, uh, I'd, per, I'd asked for more equity in the company. And this is, what he, this is what my investor told me. He said, Donnie, he says, the next time you get ready to do this, you need to prepare me so I can take down my pants and I can lay down on the bed because you're going to boop me, right? So um, what did you do? This is real life. I'm not joking. This is exactly what he said to me. I didn't get that additional equity stake I wanted in my company, but uh, I want to know what you guys did to, con to keep control so that you didn't get in a situation where you put all this work and love and time and sweat into something, your baby, and then at the end of the day, someone else owned it and walked away with it. And I just saw that happen with my friend's company this year. So, so, uh, so a couple things. Life is risk. Mm -hmm. You know, welcome to, you know, life. Like, you wake up, you go outside, there's risk. Uh, second is that you lose control at some point. If you have wild success by the time you raise CDE, you're down. Like, it's, there's no choice, right? Thirdly, one of the key things that we did is we made sure the board was composed of two founders, two investors, and then there was a fifth spot that was the tiebreaker, and then I got in a great guy who was of the stature that the VCs would want, but he was an entrepreneurial operator guy who really was invested in me emotionally, and he wanted to see me successful. So he would tell me point blank if I was wrong, but he would have sided with me in case the investors went the wrong way as well. And he was solid all the way through the acquisition. So I don't think control has to be equity, I guess is what I'm trying to get to. And then finally, like you have more control than you think because if you built a great team, like you and that team can always say, we're gonna walk if you do this. Uh, I think I just flipped off the OpenStack Summit. So so if you, if you do that, <laughs> I can just see the pictures on Twitter later. <laughs> So if you do that, though, you, you still have control. So I, I wouldn't get too hung up on the equity. Like, the main thing you should be hung up on the equity is if you can take care of your team. We had a modest exit, but my team all did really well. And I'm very proud of that because they worked so hard for me. And, like, you know, I couldn't have made it happen without them.
So we actually had a similar arrangement, but we never filled that fifth seat. And it's kind of interesting how basically the board never does anything except unanimously. Unanimously. So the lack of a fifth seat meant that decisions that we didn't want to make could not be made. Oh, that's good. Um, but that complicated things because who, then who had the right to place that seat though? It was mutual. Like you we had, had to, to come up with. We had to get a mutual. Uh, Mutually agreed by the, the two founders and the, the investors. Um, and we just never s actually filled that seat for the entirety of the company. Um, you do have a lot of influence, and it's more influence than control. Um, things you don't want to do tend not to get done because you are the person who has to actually implement them. And I think uh, to a large extent, the VC community knows that. They want to work with founders to make sure that the founders are incentivized to continue working. Um, but we didn't actually take any measures to try to keep control. We had common, sh uh, common stock from the very beginning. Uh, we sold the first, we, we took a four and a half million dollar A round and basically that sold roughly 33% of the company. So right off the bat, we were hovering around um, the ability to be in control. So, and I, I think from my experience, like the moment you take outside money, you, you, you've yeah. given up control. Yeah. That's um, it. And, but the reality is the investors that put money in are incentivized, if it's a founding CEO, they're incentivized to keep that person in, in place unless there's something really egregious going on. So for example, when we raised, we raised the IA in October and by July, uh, by July we knew we were gonna be bankrupt in the following three months. Uh, right, so I blew four and a half million bucks in ten months. Um, my bad, right? Uh, <laughs> first times for everything. Uh, so at that point, it was like, well, they could fire me right there, uh, but that's not like we're trying to rescue this thing, right? So to to uh, to bump me out at that point in time wasn't gonna gonna help save it. So we ended up getting a, a bridge round from the same investors. Um, when we helped kind of turn the ship around. But they had the right to fire me. Like, they, they could have done it at that point in time. It uh, was also the point in time where I decided, hey, maybe I should go get some help. Um, and it was nice, because I actually made, I made the decision to go hire a CEO. It wasn't the board saying, hey, it's time. Um, and so it was, it was nice to actually have, I have that piece of control um, to be able to decide when, when the time is right. Speaking of which, how's your Maserati? I, I don't own a Maserati. <laughs> should I? How's yours? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, just echoing what, what the rest of the panel said. I mean, uh, you, you, you are going to lose control the minute you raise money. Um, and the key there is to the original, one of the original points that was made earlier, um, you need to pick your, the VCs that you know are going to be in there for the long haul with you. Uh, you believe in them, they believe in you. Uh, manage the board, uh, control the board as much as you can, but ultimately you're going to lose control of that as well. So it's really how you execute and, and how, how you manage the relationship with the board, which is a quite, quite a a uh, uh, full-time job for any, any CEO, any startup CEO. Well, I think so. Randy made the point that there, is, there are tier one, tier two investors, and then there's like dumb money. Like, to some extent, there are well-intentioned investors, and there are investors that are in it to really screw you. So when we were trying to raise our A, um, the year before we actually raised, we got a term sheet from an investor, and we took it to our attorney. And he goes, this is literally the worst term sheet I've ever seen uh, of like 800 term sheets. Uh, and it was designed to basically be able to take, take control of the entire company right off the bat. And so you can tell like what what the goal of the investor is, um, pretty pretty early on. And uh, if you can set things up so that you're incentivized in the same way, right? Everybody wants an exit. Everybody wants to get return on, on their their time or on their capital. And and so if you can ensure that you're all incentivized in a similar manner, uh, you're all working towards that same goal. Anyone else? How much time we got? We got five minutes. It's okay. We can go long. I'm I'm on the next one too. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is that where you're demoing the Maserati car configurator? So, so the three guys that uh, sold their companies, would you do it again? Would you sell the company again? Would you start another one? Oh. <laughs> yes. And I'm waiting for the, ever, the entire team to be incentivized that it makes sense for us all to leave and do our, another thing. In my case, this is my second startup. So I have sold one to Cisco before. And uh, yeah, I, I wasn't married then. I've been, I was married in between. I'm married, married for this one. 
I, I definitely would do another one after this one too, but my wife would leave me. <laughs> I, um, I think I would do it again. The circumstances would have to be just right. And I think part of it is where I am in life. You know, I spent the last 26 years in the Valley and all I've ever done is startups. The biggest company I worked at besides EMC was 400 people. And so, you know, I just been living the startup life, but only twice as a founder. And the first time I didn't exit. And now I've got a four month old baby. I moved out of the Bay Area because like I wanted to actually afford a house that like, you know, isn't a hovel. And um, the exit wasn't that big. And um, and so like, you know, trying to operate out of Portland and do a startup, like, I mean, people do it, but it's not, you know, all my connections are in the Bay. So I, I'd have to think about it. But if it was like the right team, the right vision, you know, and I had a really great investor, I'd, I'd probably do it again, but I'd, I'd want the stars to align because you're taking on a ton of risk. I mean, I've been through a lot of failed startups <laughs> and, you know, it's not, you're rolling the dice, right? It's better than going and buying lottery tickets, right? And you can feel good about what you built at the end of the day, even if it didn't see the light of day and even if, you know, you didn't have an exit, you can feel good about it. I mean, my first startup, I was building an orchestration engine around Puppet in 2006. Nobody knew what the hell it was. The entire puppet community was 30 people on IRC. Like, I'm still proud that I built the first orchestration engine around Puppet. I mean, when I showed it to Luke Kinese, he was pissed. Like, he was ready to, like, shoot me, right? And because he wanted to do that, and I beat him to the punch, right? But so I still feel good about that, even though it really never saw the light of day. <laughs> you know, I, 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 people have been asking me sort of every month, are, are you ready to go do something again? Are you ready to go do something? The thought of starting something new right now just sounds like the most revolting possible thing. Uh, basically because 13, it was 13 years, like Blue Box was a 13 year journey. We raised the Series A when my daughter was a couple months old, she just turned four. Like, um, and so that whole period of her childhood like was a roller coaster. And particularly with the, with the bankruptcy stuff, like, like I was wildly depressed. I wrote a big thing on Medium about it, um, about the swings I went through. And so, like, but that's the reality of a startup. Like there is, there is no startup where everything goes right. Like it's a constant state of chaos and, and the companies that make it are the ones that can keep that chaos as contained and reined in as possible um, without having it explode. So like, I know it'll be like that again if I do it, but it's also, it's like, it's in, feels like it's in my blood. Like I, I want to do, do it again. And also it's part of it's like, was that luck? Or can I actually do it twice? Like, can I can I make something right? But I had a great friend of mine that uh, sold his company about two years prior to, to my exit. Um, and he just started a, another company again about uh, two months ago. And so it's fun to watch him go through the, the kind of the very beginning uh, and relive all of that. And he's like, wow, I forgot how hard, how hard this is. Like the grind is so hard. And he, and he just had his first kid like three weeks ago. So yeah, uh, so, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's part of who you are. And if you like that kind of self torture, um, then, then you'll do it again. Uh, it's kind of like getting a tattoo, right? Once you get one tattoo, right. you're going to go for another one. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Know, there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's no question. I mean, just to add to this point that um, uh, it's in people's DNA. Um, if you want to, frankly, control your own destiny and you find the right team of passionate people like yourselves that believes in the vision um, and you can build a team around that, then you should go for it. You should absolutely do it. It's not easy. It's going to be hard. You're going to go through ups and downs and you just have to be very, very resilient at dealing with all the challenges that you're going to find. But ultimately, if you believe in what you're doing, if you believe in the team that you're working with, and, and every day it's confirmed that, that we have made the right choice in terms of the team that we've built, do it again. Absolutely. That's actually called Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just wondering, wh how do you know when it's the right time to go and look for funding? I mean, you mentioned that you know it was a number of years. I can't remember exactly how many. Uh, and you were sort of rolling on, and things were going well. I mean, does it at some point turn against you that you've waited for so long and you've been sort of steady eddy uh, and not growing fast enough? I mean, how, how, how do you gauge that? So we, we were an anomaly. We, we broke. So there is pattern matching that happens with the venture community. And we, we, were, we didn't match any pattern. We weren't in Silicon Valley. The company had been around for eight years. We were a, service, a services company. We didn't have a product. Uh, the founding team didn't have venture experience. Like we, we, were, we shouldn't have been funded. I still to this day, I don't quite understand how it happened. Uh, Me either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we knew, like, we, we knew that the only way we were going to actually be able to build a product was if we could get out of the 
kind of the cash flow cycle that exists in a bootstrap business. And, and so uh, it sort of became a, a game of what was the story that we could sell that had enough sizzle that would show that we could leverage the kind of the incumbency that we built um, to, to grow faster. We, we were fortunate in that the growth rates at that time were sort of 100% year on year, um, which, which helped. So it wasn't as stagnant to, as it could have been. But Do you have three to six months in the bank? I mean, I think then you should be raising now. I think I think my answer is a little bit different because the first startup that I tried, I I couldn't get funded, and I found out the hard way that there's just a set of optics that you know you had. There's a checkbox list, and the reason I couldn't get funded at the time was it was like, like me and two guys and a dog in a garage basically, and they're like, yeah, you don't really have a team. And I'm like a team. I got a bunch of guys here. What do you mean you don't have a team? And they, they mean something very specific by team, and so I think. You know, um, it's really funny because you'll see some of these VCs have these recommendations about, you know, the 10 slide deck you need for a pitch deck is bullshit. You need about two slides because if in the first two slides you haven't proven that there's a market you can make money in and that you've got a way to make money in it, like they don't give a shit about the rest of it. And once they believe in that piece, then they care about have you got a team, have you got traction. So when those things all line up, you know, then it's a lot easier to raise money. You're not, it's, it'll be much less of a grind. If you've got, you know, a big customer or preferably several who will say, this is perfect, it solves this real problem I have because that's what a startup is. It's about solving real problems in the real world. Um, and then you've got the team and you can show the market, like all those things line up and, and you've got a very good shot at getting funding. But you still need at least three to six months of runway in the bank because it takes roughly two months to successfully pitch and close because of due diligence, because of, you know. It's you, a six you, month you, process, yeah. yes. Or, or, or more. On average, it's a six month process. <laughs> Extrapolate plus or minus three. Yes. Are you, if you're the CEO, you are, if you are a CEO and founder, you are always worried. There's never such a thing as having too much cash in your bank. Like, not I'm a anxious right now and I don't know why. <laughs> all right, I think we're at time. Yeah. Sorry. So thanks all for joining us. Appreciate uh, you spending the afternoon with us. And